You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. If silver goes from, say, 30 to 50, you're looking at 2x, 3x for a typical silver producer. Then at that point in time, their margins are going to be huge. So at $50, every time silver goes up $5, these stocks are probably going to go up 25%. The margins are going to be huge and the profitability. So from from silver going from 50 to 75 is going to be unbelievable um, what these stocks potentially can do. And then it could keep going. So you're looking at, I mean, when I first started doing this, I talked about, you know, once in a lifetime trade. This is it. This is the once in a lifetime trade. Silver going from 30 to 50, 50 to 75, and then potentially higher. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm Bill Powers, your host. And today we'll be speaking with Don Durrett, my friend over at goldstockdata.com. We spoke with Don last in September of 2002, right right there in uh, Q4. And Don said to expect a hard correction going into Q4 uh, of the gold price. And he was right. So Don, welcome back onto the show and tell us, is this gold correction over? Are we going to see an uptrend or might there be some sideways or even downward movement in the gold price still to come? Hey, Bill. Uh, thanks for having me back. So yeah, we're we're still in the correction zone. So we got up to gold. We got up to 2,075, I think. We didn't stay over 2,000 very long and then we went into a correction pattern. So that started in August. We went down to 1800 on uh, Sunday night. Uh, that might have been the low for this correction pattern. And we're still in it. Um, I think that the the banksters, I call them the banksters because they keep the price somewhat controlled. For instance, we had that beat down on Sunday night and we've had two beat downs in the last three weeks. And every time it gets up to try to break out, if you will. And I think the breakout is is 1950. Some people say 1920. But anytime we get close to that breakout zone, they, they've been doing these beatdowns, keeping us in this correction zone. Um, I don't know how long that correction zone is going to last. I would put the channel somewhere between 1700 and 1950. Now, 1700 is way down there. We prob- I just think we won't go below 1700, I don't believe. And I think it's a, it's a good chance we didn't get we won't get that low. But I do think that sometime in the first half of the year, we're going to correct down below 1800. Now, we could potentially break out temporarily, uh, get above 1950. I mean, who knows, maybe we can get to 2100 here in the first half. But at some point, I'm expecting a correction in the stock market, which will beat up everybody because everything se- tends to get sold at the same time. And when that happens, I think that's going to be your final low because I do think we're going to get a correction in the stock market. I also want to mention silver. So because silver is actually more exciting. So the zone silver got up to 2950. 2980 actually the correction zone for it i think is 20 well actually about 27 to to 1850 is the zone and they're both going to break out together so once we get above 1950 on gold and above 27 on silver we're probably going to be make a run and and basically be off to the races but it's hard to say when that's going to happen could be first quarter it could be second quarter Don, I tend to expect a, a major market, a stock market crash this coming year. And I do expect that the miners to sell off at least part way down. So I've gone long call options volatility as a way to hedge against that. Are there any hedges that you're employing for your mining stock portfolio? Or do you not expect the miners to fall with a major stock market crash? Well, I actually think that we're getting ready to enter a bull market. We're actually in a bull market for gold and silver right now. We have been in a bull market for gold since we got out of the channel at 1370. Um, and we've been in the silver bull market since July when we got above 1850. So since we just are in these bull markets, I'm not really uh, don't think it's time to hedge. I just think that you can keep some um, cash on the side and to buy the dip. Um, and that's what I'm doing. Any you know, if we go down here to say 22 or below 20, I just think those are buying opportunities. I'm not worried about in this big sell-off that we're going to go down, you know, $1,600 silver or $1,600 gold. I just don't see that in the cards right now. You know, we get this MMT where they're just printing like crazy. I, I think we're going higher. So I'm not really that concerned about hedging now. Now, when you could possibly think about hedging is after we get the breakout. So Silver is set up unbelievably well. So the reason why is because silver has really only had two bull markets in its history. One was in 79.80 when it went to 50, and then it didn't stay at 50 very long and it immediately crashed. 
And then again in 20, 2011, we got to 50 and then it immediately crashed. So we haven't had these extended bull markets in silver. We've never had one. So once it gets above 30, um, there's really the only resistance point is at 35. So you're going to get this massive move from 30 to 50. So the only time you really, I think you really even think about hedging is when we get that $50 silver, we get to 50, then you basically go, I got all this profit, might as well hedge some. But until then, I think you have to be very bullish. Are you worried about an economic contraction at all this year? If it happens, it's actually going to be good for gold because it's basically the fear trade. So we already have these negative re real rates. Inflation seems to be edging up a little bit. Janet Yellen said she wants to have a strong dollar. That means she wants to get rates lower. So that means negative real rates are going to be with us all year. I don't see inflation crashing. I, I see these negative real rates maintaining. I don't see rates taking off this year. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I was reading last night about Europe trying to control their high high bond yields. Japan in 2016, they basically put uh, a cap on their 10-year at zero. Um, and historically, the U.S. has allowed uh, bond prices to basically uh, go by the market. They haven't basically manipulated them. And now um, we're starting to see, so Europe is manipulating their, their long bonds, their 10. So we had Japan started it, Europe, and now the U.S. is going to be next. So the U.S. is basically going to start capping their longer bonds. They already capped the lower end, right, when they control them. So that means negative real rates, right? So that's going to be good for gold. Um, so even if we have any type of uh, correction, if you will, economically, like, let's say we have a double dip. Everybody's so bullish right now in the economy. Everybody thinks we're going to have these, you know, these really, really strong economic numbers um, in this year and next year. I'm not so sure we're going to have them. But, I mean, that's the one thing that can hurt gold, because if we have these really strong economic numbers, people are going to say, I don't need gold. And then we stay under $2,000 gold for a while. The only way you get really going to get above $2,000 gold is if the fear trade comes back. I'm not in this crowd where gold's going to go up because everything goes up. The everything bubble, you know, that's really not how gold works. Gold is a fear trade. It's a hedge trade. So if, if, if the stock market is doing fantastic, and it is right now, and it continues to do fantastic, you're not going to have a money. Money is going to roll out, go into gold and any big numbers. They're going to stay in the market. They're going to stay in stocks. So we need um, the economy to basically roll over, get weak, in order for us to get this big breakout above 2000 I don't know when that's going to happen, but I'm looking Q2. So Q1's not looking really great. It's kind of a, you know, blah, blah. I think we're going to kind of stay in this channel for gold and silver. Orfinders Resources is exploring for and developing high-grade gold assets in the prolific Abitibi Greenstone Belt of Ontario and Quebec, which has seen over 50 million ounces of historic gold production. Billionaire mining financier Eric Sprott is a strong backer of Orfinders, and insiders own 15% of the company. Listen to CEO Stephen Stewart. We are in this to make a discovery. Uh, we are in this to sell this company and uh, make money just like the rest of our shareholders do. And now it's all about putting the money into the ground and looking for that billion dollar drill hole that we seek. Orfinders trades under ORX in Toronto and under the ticker ORFDF on the OTC. To learn more, go to orfinders.ca. That's orfinders.ca. Looking back on last year uh, and your mining stock in investing, what was one of the biggest mistakes or lessons learned that you could share? Last year? Last year, 2020. The, the lesson was that you didn't buy the dip. Now, this is one of my lessons. I, I really didn't have any lessons I need to learn. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, the lesson was that you needed to buy the dip in March, right? I mean, we had some unbelievable opportunities back in March. It's like when you get a sell-off like that and you know you're going into a bull market, it's buy, buy, buy. And a lot of times people have trouble buying dips. That's when you, that's when you have to buy your dips is uh, get positioned. And um, you know, and get ready. And the one thing is, so I'm always doing this for. Um, I'm looking at fifty, seventy, five hundred dollars silver. I mean, that's my target. So I'm always put, you know, positioning my portfolio around that. And so the one thing that I really recognized was that, you know, you, we there was a chance that we could we could go through um, twenty seven dollars and then get through thirty and then run to fifty. There was a chance to do that. So you wanted to make sure that you 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 were ready for that that run that you were basically invested, but at the same time, you have to be, realize that there's a, there's a chance that that doesn't happen. And what the, the and the obverse of that is that you get stuck, and then you pull back. 
And so you always want to leave a little bit of cash on the side for that event. And that's what's happening. And because over time, you never know what stock is really going to appear on the horizon. You always kind of don't want to be, you're always looking for that stock that, that looks great. My point is that you don't make assumptions, you look at different outcomes. And so, and that's where we're at right now. We're at a, we're at a couple outcomes, you know, when do we break out? Do we break out in first quarter, second quarter? Do we have a bottom in yet? You start looking at these various outcomes, but the, the long-term picture is being positioned for fifty, seventy, five hundred dollars silver, and for people that are really aggressive, all, all the way to one hundred fifty dollars silver. And I put myself in that crowd. When you look back over last year, uh, would you be willing to share your best performing mining stock or mining stocks? What were your biggest gainers? Yeah, I had several. Uh, the one, probably one of the better one, was pure gold mining. I actually bought it at ten cents, and it was like a twenty bagger. Uh, another one that was, well, there was several that were fantastic because I had a lot of optionality plays. Uh, stocks like um, Discovery Metals that I bought for super cheap and Discovery just absolutely, you know, these were stocks that were so out of favor, so cheap. And they're up, when I say optionality, I mean, they, they had, Discovery had like a billion ounces of silver and it was priced at like less than, you know, less than a dollar an ounce, way less than a dollar, 50 cents an ounce. So the optionality was unbelievable. So another one, uh, Free Gold Ventures, um, another optionality play everybody was ignoring. Um Golden Tag, several of these optionalities that I had that really um, took off well. I got into Skeena real early. I really liked it. Skeena has been doing great. Uh, it's still going well. Lion One, got in early on that one. Um, Ascot did really well. I and mean, a lot of producers are starting to kick into gear that I've done well with. And I think they're going to do really well. And you like those mid tiers more so than the majors too, if I recall, right, Don? Yeah, so I use a pyramid approach, meaning that the base of the pyramid is physical and majors. So I have a lot of physical silver and I have three mutual funds that are all basically loaded up with majors. I use mutual funds for income um, because I feel that the majors are going to do really well um, with dividends over time. Um, So I do that kind of as as my base. And then the middle, and then I do own a few majors individually, like I own Yamana. I think Yamana is going to do well. Uh, Ken Ross, I think, is going to do well. Some, some of them, but most of my majors I own in the mutual funds. And then mid-tiers, I think, is, you know, my book, I talk about mid-tiers as being the sweet spot. I really believe that mid-tiers are really your best risk-reward. So you want to get a mid-tier between, say, $100 million and $300 million. I try I really like to get a mid-tier um, under $200 million. $175, 200 is really a really good place for me, good entry zone. Because those stocks can, they're already strong stocks and they can easily get over a billion dollars. Like I said, the risk reward's fantastic. I'll go up to 250, three, 350 million market caps on these entry prices and sometimes a little higher than that. But those are, that's kind of like the sweet spot in investing for me. Um, yeah. And I really like uh, producers, especially producers in Canada, producers in Australia, um, because I feel those have, they're going to get paid at a premium. And I just feel that um, these could be cash flow machines over time. And the, even the midterms are going to turn into being dividend stocks. And they're just fantastic plays. So, yeah, I'm, I'm producer heavy, if you will. Um, and I'm also silver heavy. No, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm silver heavy. I only have 37% allocated to silver because it's tough because there's not a lot of silver plays out there. And I like to have kind of low cost bases. So. But, but you do go in big on the producers in your, within your silver portfolio. Uh, no, I only go on big on ETFs and mutual funds. On individual stocks, I like to go 2% or less. Except for First Majestic, if I recall, though, right? No, First Majestic, my original investment was 1%. Oh, but it's grown. <laughs> oh, yeah. The cost base is, I mean, the cost base is only 1%. Is a dollar, right? Yeah. I rarely go more than 1% cost basis for an individual stock. I will go 2% a few times at 1-2. What's happened is, is that you'll get a stock, you'll go in 1% or even 2%. And then they'll buy another company and then your cost basis goes up. So my cost basis really went up over at Hecla because they bought like three companies that I owned and I've held on to them. And so um, that happens. And sometimes you'll start off with like, you know, 0.5% and it'll go to 1.5% because you're buying um, your, your, your cost base, you're lowering your cost basis. That happens once in a while. But no, uh, my initial entry prices for an individual stock, I rarely go over 1%. And if it's a discovery, I'm I'm like 0.5% or less, 0.25%. I go really, really low in my discovery plays. And you're just looking for a free 50 bagger out of those discovery plays is how you look at it, right? Well, I'm looking for a 10 plus bagger. I call it 10 bagger a home run. I'm looking for a 10 bagger plus. 
you know, 50 baggers are rare, 20 baggers are rare, but 10 baggers for an exploration play is pretty, you know, that can happen a lot. Um, you find a good drill story and you get in early, it should be a five or 10 bagger unless it peters out. But those first initial drill holes, if they're solid and you get in early, those stocks usually perform pretty well. Yep. Based on feedback that you've been getting from your hundreds of subscribers, uh, as we kind of wrap it up, what advice would you give mining speculators for 2021? Uh, my advice would be that we are getting ready to do, get something historic. This is something that's never ever happened before. And that is a bull market um, that's extended. So especially in silver. So silver, it needs to go up 100% just to get to an all-time high. It's at 25, it has to go to 50 to get to an all-time high. Well, that's the starting point. So if silver runs, say, and again, $27 is the breakout zone. When it gets over 27, then it starts running, and it goes to 50. At $50 silver, you're going to see, and there's not a lot of silver producers, there's only 18 silver miners that produce more than 1 million ounces a year. There's not that many. So if you own 15 of the silver miners, you basically say, these three I don't like, and I'll, I'll take the other 15. You're going to have returns that are phenomenal, potentially phenomenal. So you want to get exposed. Again, this has never happened before, ever in history. An extended bull market in silver. So if silver goes from, say, 30 to 50, you're looking at 2x, 3x for a typical silver producer. Then at that point in time, their margins are going to be huge. So at $50, every time silver goes up $5, these stocks are probably going to go up 25%. The margins are going to be a, a huge and the profitability. So the, from, from silver going from 50 to 75 is going to be unbelievable um, what these stocks potentially can do. And then it could keep going. So you're looking at, I mean, when I first started doing this, I talked about, you know, once in a lifetime trade. This is it. This is the once in a lifetime trade. Silver going from 30 to 50, 50 to 75, and then potentially higher. The returns, companies that call themselves silver miners, you got 18. That's it. And they're basically all mid tiers, except for you got Pan American, Fresneo, and now Hecla that I would call majors. You got three majors, uh, 15, and then about, I don't know, 10 mid tiers and five small caps, something like that. So it's a small bunch of stocks, and the leverage is unbelievable. That's why I said that's pretty historic. So that's what I'm going to leave them with. <laughs> Don, that's excellent advice. And I, I'm with you and I hope you're right because I'm levered up with uh, Silver Juniors and warrants of Silver Juniors. Don's website is goldstockdata.com. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. Don, thanks for coming on the show today and we'll be catching up with you in a couple months. One final thing. So um, yeah, anybody's listening today, just go to uh, my website, uh, Goldstock Data, go to the contact us, send me an email and ask for a free trial and I'll set you up. Excellent. Goldstockdata.com. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Bill. 